You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. You can make this possible. Um, clearly, the Bloomberg campaign, clearly they are in damage control. Uh, he has provided these various statements. As I have said uh, repeatedly, uh, that what has to happen here is this, he simply cannot think that this is going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, releasing a statement or releasing commercials is not going to make it go away. Michael Bloomberg, if he wants to be taken seriously, he already spent $350 million. Yep. Michael Bloomberg is going to have to sit down mm -hmm. with black media, black journalists, hold town halls to look black people in the eye and explain why he's saying this now in 2020 when we heard very clearly where he stood in 2013. Mm -hmm. And people are going to have to believe that there's actually been some evolution and some growth and some soul searching uh, and some repentance uh, for some of the things that have happened in the past. He should come on this show. He should come on other shows and sit down with a significant amount of time uh, and talk about how he has grown, if he has, um, if he expects folks to actually believe him. Yeah, everybody, all these candidates are running around the country, so he's going to have to invest some time in those various states, in communities of color, sitting down. If I was him, it'd be tough. I'd go into some barber shops. I would go to town hall meetings uh, and actually spend the resources to pull folks together. And actually, and I know you go into barber shops, people are going to light you up uh, for some of the things that you did. But, well, <laughs> well, but, 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 I, but I think that the, the reason th this is important, Kelly, is because what we're dealing with is this moment of reckoning. Mm -hmm. What we're dealing with right now is that when we talk about these candidates, whether it's Joe Biden in the 1994 crime bill, mm -hmm. whether it's, uh, and we're going to play in a second, Senator Amy Klobuchar having to deal mm -hmm. with her record as a prosecutor, Pete Buttigieg when it comes to the criticisms of his role operating as uh, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana and police departments and African Americans. They are going to have to right. deal with this moment of reckoning and forget trying to sit here and bring up Donald Trump, right. who has his own issues, and I'm going to deal with that in a second, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what they're going to have to do. I personally do not see how Bloomberg can come back from this effectively, um, mainly because, unlike the other candidates, this happened at the end of Bloomberg's term. Um, in his mayorship. So there's no way for him at this particular point in time to rectify that. So, for example, when you want to talk about Biden's history of criminal reform or Amy Klobuchar's remarks or even uh, Buttigieg's uh, remarks and, and policies, they have um, evidence of, act, of actions that they have done to rectify their wrongs because whatever they did was after those remarks and those bills that came about. With Bloomberg, he's on the campaign trail. He's not mayor of New York anymore. There's nothing that he can do outside of an apology campaign to possibly um, change anybody's mind. And right now, after listening to that tape, I don't see the difference between him and 45 putting out full page ads of the exonerated five. Like that is the exact same type of rhetoric that had 45, you know, being completely biased in the media and whatnot. Like I, th this was not just a remark that he did. This was not just, you know, a thought in his head. He came up with a strategy at Aspen Institute of perpetuating an already flawed but existing school to prison pipeline, stop and frisk procedures, inherently racial bias that is embedded in police policy. Mm -hmm. Like he perpetuated all of that in his remarks. So this wasn't just a remark. This wasn't some off the hand statement. This was a strategy that he didn't um, come up off of until a court said that he had to. So I don't know how he can come back from this. One of the issues here, um, Malik, is that they increased stop and frisk as crime was going down. Mm -hmm. You would think that 
if crime is going down, mm -hmm. you are limiting stop and frisk. That's not what they did. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so many problems that I have with this. Um, one of those is the fact that it, it kind of reminded, well, two things. So when, I, when listening to him, I thought Super Predator. The other thing that I thought is that it was almost like an all lives matter moment in his statement that he gave. Instead of addressing the comments at the beginning of it, like I don't know who's advising him. I don't know, mm -hmm. so I don't know if this is just his personal ego mm -hmm. or who is advising him. You know, the mayor from DC, you know, probably could have told him something different since she endorsed him. But at the beginning of your statement, mm -hmm. you talk about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. You don't say, hey, I realize that, you know, I'm at a different place. This was at a different time. You don't mention your comments until the end of your statement. And then you follow up with more talking about Donald Trump. The other problem that I have with this is that he made these comments after he was, he was, he was no longer in office. Mm. So it's not like he was sitting there in the middle of this, right. debating it, having an intellectual conversation, a good give and take. He made this two years after he left office, which meant that he co he believed everything that he did while he was in office. Because, and two years after. Yeah, because yeah. you're defending it even after you left office. Yeah. So I kind of agree with Kelly on this. I don't see how he comes back. Yes, there are criticisms that you can make about people who are prosecutors. You know, there were there were criticisms that we had about Kamala Harris. There are criticisms that you can make about Kobachar. But his comments, I mean, he's talking about throwing... Throw, Throwing people up against the wall yeah, well, dude, two years after he was yeah. in office, after he was no longer in office. But it's, it's deeper that. than that. It's deeper than that. So just let me add this real quick, Roland. So, you know, whether it is a billion dollars or a hundred million dollars that was additionally given to the police force mm -hmm. in New York, if you want to eradicate crime, if you want to change the dynamics that are happening, then you have to make investments right. inside of those communities. Right. Those dollars could have very easily been changed and they would have gotten positive results out of it. And here's the other thing that, that just gets me sometimes. We create this false narrative that it is African Americans and, and Latinx folks who are the ones who are doing the crime. When I grew up in Appalachia, there was less than 1% people exactly. of color, but there exactly. was all kinds of crime that was happening, mm -hmm. and it was associated with poverty, mm -hmm. and if you wanted to address it, you could make change. And he didn't have to go any further than outside of New York and go to upstate New York mm -hmm. to parts where there are very little or very small numbers of people of color where he could find out that there was still significant crime happening where they did not have stop and frisk as their answer to addressing the issue. My other what, issue... What, what, what oh, is... Go ahead. Oh, my other issue um, about this that really, really got to me, but it... Aside from everything, but the fact that he basically said you can just put it on a piece of paper and like yeah. Xerox it. <laughs> First no. of all, no. we had a whole thing in Baltimore City um, where uh, that was basically told uh, through the DOJ that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if anybody recalls that con um, consent decree mm -hmm. from DOJ after the Freddie Gray uprising where we found uh, forms, just like what Bloomberg is mm -hmm. talking about in Baltimore City that the uh, police department was using up there for crimes such as this and how how detrimental and damaging that was mm -hmm. to the city. So I can only imagine what it was like in New York, people using those forms, if they were ever used. I, right, right, I right. sincerely uh, believe that they were, whether we find them or not. But it, this, this, again, it was a strategy. It was not a remark. Right. This was a strategy, and I, I it, I'm, I'm speechless. This is well, let, let me. No, um, um, first of all, let me. The Trump folks obviously jumped on this Donald Trump, retweeted something, but then he deleted that tweet. Uh, I guess probably after he got exposed himself, uh, because. Uh, his campaign, Brad Pascal Pers and others that are out there, uh, and I wish we have some issues with my HDMI line here, so uh, I, I want to play this video for you of uh, Brad being on with Dana Perino when she challenged him because this is what Donald Trump said in 2016, quote, I would do stop and frisk. I think you have to. We did it in New York. It worked incredibly well, and you have to be proactive and, you know, you really help people sort of change their mind automatically. I remember so, that. So the Trump administration... I remember that. ...cannot all of a sudden try... Because they're sitting here 
trying to amplify this whole thing. Oh, Bloomberg is a racist. Liberals should be outraged at what he had to say. That's like the Klan trying to say to a neo-Nazi, look at them. Don't look at us. Mm-hmm. But also, Don- you know, Donald Trump has absolutely no room none. to talk about anything about Bloomberg's comments when Donald Trump himself believes in stop and frisk. When he said he, w- he wanted to implement stop and frisk nationally after, y'all, Trump said this in 2016, 2013, I told you, three years earlier, a federal judge ruled stop and frisk unconstitutional. So what Donald Trump said and what Bloomberg also was endorsing was a policy that was declared unconstitutional by a federal judge. Uh, do y'all have the let me know y'all have the video uh, from that article uh, in 2013? Um, guys, I need you to pull it up, please. It's a minute 27. It's a minute 27 seconds. It's a video of Mike Bloomberg. Excuse Mike Bloomberg defending uh, stop and frisk. Uh, this obviously, folks, uh, and, and the reason this is this is such a a huge issue because look. Uh, Bloomberg lays out his criminal justice plan. He lays, he goes to Tulsa, lays out his economic plan. But the problem is when you as a politician, you don't actually learn from your mistakes. There are people who have made decisions. They say, you know what? I made a mistake voting for the Iraq war. Mm-hmm. Joe Biden has not been pressed in a single debate. Not one debate about the 1994 crime bill. Now, I don't know what the hell the other candidates are doing. Uh, something tells me, February 25th, when they debate in Charleston, South Carolina, and I'll be there, something tells me he's going to get asked about 1994 crime bill. But he's been asked before, and he's actually defended it. That's an issue. You've heard other candidates in terms of how they have had to deal with this. In fact, I'm going to play this right now. Uh, here, this, this is uh, Amy Klobuchar. Today, she was on The View, and she was pushed by co-host Sonny Hostin regarding her record as a DA. Watch this. Uh, a Washington Post poll from last month had you with less than 0.5 percent of African American support. That's lower than even Mayor Pete Buttigieg. Uh, he has two percent. And I've said this often on the show: you need African American support to become the Democratic nominee. Now, your tough-on-crime approach, when you were a county attorney in Minnesota, is criticized for disproportionately harming uh, black and, and, and brown uh, people. And when I look at that that record. You know, you failed to prosecute a single killing by the police during the eight years you headed prosecutions. And there were more than two dozen police-involved killings in that period. That's just one example. How do you defend that record? Okay, well, let's start. um, I'll lead out to the support, but I want to start with my work as county attorney. Um, We all know there's systematic racism in this criminal justice system. There's no doubt about that. And I worked really hard when I was there, and I'm proud of the work we did to go after white-collar criminals, uh, to use drug court uh, in a big way. We had a very successful drug court, and we actually found a Uh, got a 12% decrease in incarceration rates for African Americans. Um, And I also diversified the office, which I think is really, really important. But there is so much more work that we have to do. And that's why when I got to the U.S. Senate, I uh, started working on things like the First Step Act, uh, which we passed, which has uh, decreased uh, the criminal penalties and allowed uh, some nonviolent offenders to get out to prison, get out of prison. I think we have to do that in a bigger way as well. And then as for my support in the African-American community, I've always had strong support in my elections at home. And I have a number of key leaders in the African-American community from Minnesota that have gone and campaigned for me in places like California and Iowa. And that will continue. So my challenge uh, is to get people to know me. Uh, My message of economic opportunity, of investing in our schools, I think that matters. Um, I think that my focus on voting rights, Sonny, I am the leader on the bill to register every kid in this country when they turn 18. I think that is going to matter. I'm the leader on the bill to get rid of gerrymandering, to get rid of voting purges. As my friend Stacey Abrams, who 
Go but ahead. Senator, you know, I think that your, your record as a prosecutor matters as well. And when you campaign sure. for the Senate, uh, you cited your prosecution of 16-year-old black teenager Mayan Burrell as an example of having been an aggressive prosecutor. And it gives me no pleasure to say this because, as you know, I was a prosecutor as well. I've reviewed the facts of that case, and it is one of the most flawed investigations and prosecutions that I think I have ever seen. Um, when you look at it, you have your homicide detective on tape offering informants 500 bucks a piece for names. Um, when I looked at it, I also saw that Mr. Burrell's alibis were, alibi witnesses were not looked at. His, his surveillance tapes were not looked at. I mean, how do you defend something like that to someone like me who is the mother of a black boy, a black teenager? This case would be my worst nightmare. Well, Sonny, I'll start with this. I've been very clear. All of the evidence needs to be immediately reviewed in that case. Uh, the past evidence and also any new evidence that has come forward, I've called for that. And I think you and I both share that background. And I have always believed that a job of a prosecutor is to protect the innocent and convict the guilty. But protect the innocent has to be key. So this case uh, involved an 11-year-old African-American girl uh, who was shot doing her homework at her kitchen table. I got to know uh, her uh, family and I worked with them. Uh, but I would say I think any prosecutor who cares about justice, and I've always been on the side of justice, would say all evidence must be reviewed immediately. And that's what I think has to happen here. Well, you're a U.S. So thank senator. You for bringing it well, up. you're a U.S. senator now. You're a powerful woman. What do you yes. intend to do to right this yes. wrong? Well, I've called for uh, the office and the courts to review the evidence. Uh, that is what we must do in the justice system. I've also worked extensively with the Innocence Project uh, in my previous job, and we reviewed all the serious cases we had that involved DNA evidence. This one didn't, uh, but we involved, uh, reviewed those cases. It had cases. no gun, it had no I DNA evidence, and it had no fingerprints. Are we prosecuting exactly. Amy Exactly, so this is today? a case that must <laughs> It must be reviewed, Sonny. I think you know that I care so much about justice, and this case must be reviewed. See, so perfect example. I mean, none of these people have challenged Amy Klobuchar. Now, they, if folks went after Senator Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. has said nothing to Klobuchar. Uh, as Sonny said, she's barely, po she's not even getting 1% among black people. If folks are acting like somehow uh, she can rise, rise, uh, uh, rise to the top here. Uh, but, but this is an issue. Again, if you go back to 2016, the damage that the super predators comment had on Hillary Clinton, uh, not just amplified by Russian trolls, but also there were a lot of people who said, look, here was a, you know, here was a problem, but also being defensive about a comment as opposed to being forthright and apologizing. Bloomberg has apologized for the comment. The problem is that he apologized after he'd already decided he was running for president. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. If, if Michael Bloomberg had apologized in, so he leaves off of December 31st, 20, 2013. If Michael Bloomberg had apologized in 2014 mm -hmm. or 15 or 16 yeah. or 17 or 18 or even January 2019, it will be seen differently. But the fact of the matter is, as, early, as late as January 2019, Michael Bloomberg was defending stop and frisk. Six years after a federal judge called it unconstitutional. Yeah. Six years after all of the data had been revealed mm -hmm. that it did not have an impact uh, on reducing crime. That 95% of the people were stopped uh, did not uh, have anything wrong with them. And in fact, crime went down in New York mm -hmm. after stopping, st stop and frisk end it he still mm -hmm. was defending it yeah so there I'm, i will give klobuchar the same break that i gave kamala harris 
people, what people need to understand is that there are very few prosecutors who end up becoming president of the United States mm -hmm. for reasons as we're seeing right now. You know, there are a lot of, you probably can go through any prosecutor's case, and I think Sonny was a little, she did probably a little more than I think was necessary. No, she did exactly probably, what was necessary. Because you probably can go through any prosecutor's file mm -hmm. and pick out a case and say this is where it but Melly, was. But Melly, but Melly, any, any prosecutor is not running for president. I, and when you run for president, your entire record is there. And so on one hand, you cannot in debate after debate yeah. talk about this and that about criminal justice reform and not own up to your, your own past. And so by pressing her, Sonny did exactly what she was supposed to do because in the fact, Sonny did what too many of these debate moderators have not done mm -hmm. and these other journalists have not done is to challenge her. They were very, folk, the same debate when they challenged Senator Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. On her record, Klobuchar was standing on the exact same stage mm -hmm. and not a single question was directed towards her about her record as a DA. Yeah, but my point is, is that I, I, I give her a break for the same reasons that I gave Kamala Harris a break, because they're both prosecutors. And so, like, as I said, there are many, you can probably pull anything from any prosecutor's record and say, this is where I think that you flawed, that you were flawed, or you did something that was to the disadvantage of black people. Um, that, that part is actually true. I do think that she needs to be questioned on it. I don't think it's unfair for her to actually be questioned on these things. I just think when it comes to the role of a prosecutor, and even, in fact, even defense attorneys for that matter, but this you know, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Kelly, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, this goes beyond just the questioning of prosecutors. I understand your point that, you know, and I come from law, so I understand prosecutors have a very difficult job. They have to make very difficult decisions on behalf of you know, not just one client, such as right. the defense attorney, but the entire state or whatever right. jurisdiction they're representing. Right. However, what I will say, especially when it comes to the to the debate stage, these moderators are really handling these candidates with kid gloves in in the sense that they just, it, it's like they are also somehow the PR team for these individual candidates yeah. so that they will look in the, they will look, uh, in the best light mm -hmm. uh, against 45. I believe so, that. I you believe know, that. So, because, you know, it, it's no question that the Democratic Party wants to defeat 45 for this election. Mm -hmm. So what are they going to do to try and just have a soft on-ramp for that strategy to take place and actually succeed? Don't ask difficult questions because everybody on that stage has something that is going to be debatable. And what's happening right now is we are now, you know, nearing November, and people need these tough questions asked. And then mm -hmm. what happens? You get something like this on The View, something that should have been asked and answered a year and a half ago when everybody was, you mm -hmm. know, coming on and uh, doing their little soft campaign speeches and stuff like that. This would have been rectified by now. I, I want to play but, this here before I go to Mustafa. I want to play this here. This is what Michael Bloomberg, again, had to say in... August of 2013, after the federal judge declared stop and frisk unconstitutional. That uh, so we can get the audio straight, guys. Let me know when it's ready, okay? Uh, because again, the, the, the reason this is important is because. When you are in the moment, Mustafa, mm -hmm. you're speaking truthfully. Mm -hmm. You're not, oh, after, you know, I, I reduced it by the end of my term, whatever. No. Right. Michael Bloomberg was adamant. We're going to continue to do this. Right. He's speaking from his heart at that time. There was no communications director. There was no, you know, press release that he was reading from. He was saying how he actually felt about what was, you know, what he was instituting. Um, and, and what his true views were about the people who this um, enforcement set of actions and policies was focused on. So he was very clear with folks um, at that time. And, and you know, you know, every time we see somebody run for office, all of a sudden they want to clean it up. Yeah. Be honest about who you are. Let the country see exactly how you feel about these things so they can make the decision can, that's can necessary. Can I just offer Go. this very Go quickly? Yeah, um, one of the reasons, to your point about why other candidates may not be doing it, if, you know, I'm sure all of us watch the debates, remember, 
there, even in, I think, the first or second debate and subsequent debates, when, when, the, when the candidates attacked each other, mm -hmm. I remember Kamala Harris had a moment where she was the adult in the room. Well, we shouldn't do this to each other. Our focus is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Cory Booker had another moment. Our focus should be Donald Trump. We shouldn't be attacking each other. Donald Trump is the one. So there, that actually could be part of the reason. Yeah, everybody's having have... a united front on, you know, somebody right. from the Democratic Party right. becoming president as opposed to 45. Yeah. And and low key, that's an issue because it should be the best candidate representing us as Americans being the president. But, but we don't believe it is 45, and therefore it. it should be somebody else. All right, here's the uh, again, this is Bloomberg in 2013. The judge made it clear she was not at all interested in the crime reductions here or how we achieve them. In fact, nowhere in her 195-page decision does she mention the historic cuts in crime or the number of lives that have been saved. She ignored the real-world realities of crime, the fact that stops match up with crime statistics, and the fact that our police officers on patrol, the majority of whom are black, Hispanic, or members of other ethnic or racial minorities, make an average about less than one stop a week. And even though the plaintiff's own expert found that about 90% of the stops have been conducted appropriately and lawfully, and another 5% may well have been conducted appropriately and, law and lawfully, the judge still wants to put the NYPD into receivership based on the flim flimsiness of evidence in a handful of cases. No federal judge has ever imposed a monitor over a city's police department following a civil trial. The Department of, Def of Justice under Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama never not once found reason to investigate the NYPD. But one small group of advocates and one judge conducted their own investigation, and it was pretty clear from the start which way it would turn out. And this was Say, th wow. no, this was, this was the day the judge yep. made the decision. In 13? In her one, in, 13. Yes, in August. Wow. This New York Times story is dated August 12th, 2013, and that was Michael Bloomberg addressing the media, chastising a federal judge for her ruling, wow. slamming the individuals who filed the lawsuit, calling it flimsy evidence when we now know mm -hmm. that without a doubt, their evidence was absolutely strong, and the only thing flimsy was his defense and the defense of Commissioner Kelly mm -hmm. in supporting Stop and Frisk. Mm -hmm. And see, this is, this is why I keep saying, folks, Michael Bloomberg's campaign has a major problem now. <laughs> I mean, not just because uh, of the previous stuff, not, not even just because uh, of this audio that, 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 that Benjamin has, has Dixon released. The problem now is we have to judge how you felt in that very moment and how six years passed and you said six years, so he left office in December uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So six years and five months went by before he apologizes. Mm. And then says, oh, I was wrong. But you weren't wrong for six years. You were defending it for six years. And, and to listen, to listen, so I'm going to do this here. I need y'all to queue up. I need y'all to queue up the audio uh, that Ben Dixon released. I need you to queue that up, please. I need you to queue that up. And so I'm going to play again for you. I, I mean, So go right back to my iPad right now. Go. The judge made it clear she was not at all interested in the crime reductions here or how we achieve them. In fact, nowhere in her 195-page decision does she mention the historic cuts in crime or the number of lives that have been saved. She ignored the real-world realities of crime, the fact that stops match up with crime statistics, and the fact that our police officers on patrol, the majority of whom are black, Hispanic, or members of other ethnic or racial minorities, make an average about less than one stop a week. And even though the plaintiff's own expert found that about 90% of the stops have been conducted appropriately and lawfully, and another 5% may well have been conducted appropriately and, law and lawfully, the judge still wants to put the NYPD into receivership based on the flimsiness of evidence in a handful of cases. 
No federal judge has ever imposed a monitor over a city's police department following a civil trial. The Department of, Def of Justice under Presidents Clinton, Bush, and Obama never, not once, found reason to investigate the NYPD. But one small group of advocates and one judge conducted their own investigation, and it was pretty clear from the start which way it would turn out. Now, I now want you to play comments. That was August of 2013. Now play Michael Bloomberg at the Aspen Institute in 2015. 95% of your murders and murderers and murder victims fit in one MO. You can just take the description, Xerox it, and pass it out to all the cops. They are male minorities, 15 to 25. That's true in New York, it's true in virtually every city in the And that's where the real crime is. You've got to get the guns out of the hands of the people that get killed. So you've got to be one of them. Spend the money for a lot of cops in the street. Put those cops where the crime is, which means in the minority neighborhood. So this is one of the unintended consequences is people say, oh my God, you are arresting kids for marijuana that are all minorities. Yes, that's true. Why? Because we put all the cops in the minority neighborhoods. Yes, that's true. Why do we do it? Because that's where all the crime is. And the way she got the guns out of the kids' hands is to throw them against the wall and frisk them. And then they start, they say, oh, I don't want that, I don't want to get caught, so they don't bring the gun. They still have a gun, but they leave it at home. Okay, folks, this is a column that John Lott uh, wrote on foxnews.com um, a few hours ago. Now, he's a columnist for foxnews.com, but John Lott is also the former chief economist at the United States Sentencing Commission uh, and also the author of a number of different books. So let me go ahead and walk you through this. So this is what you talk about, that 95% that, that, that uh, piece. Uh, he wrote the most recent data at, at the time his comments were made from the 2013 FBI Uniform Crime Report don't line up with the 95% figure. He said, according to the FBI data, among murderers whose race we knew, almost 44% were white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The FBI doesn't break down Hispanic numbers. Uh, he said, but if we assume all Hispanic murderers were white, about 23% of murderers were non-Hispanic whites. If you were to Xerox the description that Bloomberg gives, you're going to be falsely identifying a lot of minorities as criminals. Quote, Bloomberg is no more accurate when it comes to the age of murderers. It is true that young people were responsible for a disproportionate share of these crimes, but the numbers were nowhere close to what Bloomberg claims. Just over 28% of murderers were between 13 and 25 years of age. About 35% of 13 to 25 year olds murderers were white. Again, Bloomberg chastises these activists, mm -hmm. chastises a federal judge, calls, they said they, they, they did their own investigation, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you now look at it and go, oh my God, they were right, and he was completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Again, to me, for Mike Bloomberg to move forward, it is not going to be a statement. He cannot go to Good Morning America. Mm -hmm. He cannot go talk to Robert Roberts. He cannot go talk to Gail King. Mm -hmm. You can't go talk to Craig Mellon on NBC. Mike Bloomberg's going to have to come talk to black media. I don't even think... Mike, Mike, Mike Bloomberg's going to have to actually do community forums mm -hmm. in front of black people. He cannot... He is not going to be able to go to the safe space mm -hmm. of mainstream media, do a 20 or 30 minute interview, and then go, okay... Uh, 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 I, I, I finish with that because remember the previous interview he did. I forgot which which one of the networks, where he somebody asked him the question. He went, "Look, I've already apologized for, for that." And basically, with this whole, oh, yeah. I'm done. I, like, yeah. like literally, this, this was like in this was wow. he gave the apology in December. I think it was I think it was in January, mm -hmm. wow. and his response was, "Look, I've already apologized for that. Mm -hmm. Essentially, I need you to move on. That ain't gonna fly." Mm -mm. And his campaign. I'm telling you, if I'm them, I'm preparing him to say, dude, you're going to have to grovel. I wouldn't even say that. I'm like, dude, your campaign is over. No. I would. It's not because, over. Well, it's not over. my thing is, when it comes to the media such as, like, such as your platform, such as other predominantly black platforms, I don't see any type of campaign or comm strategy that could reverse this. It's not over. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, first of all, it's not over. If Joe Biden can be the author of the 1994 crime bill 
and he's running for president, but again, it's not with, over. But with Biden, he still had policy after the 1994 crime bill that would rectify that. that. But, 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 Rupert doesn't but, have but, that. But, but, but here's the piece. It's, first of all, it's not over. So there's no... There, his campaign is not over. Okay? Now, is he going to take a hit? Yes. The question, though, is how does he now respond, Mustafa, mm -hmm. to where this is going to be the dominant story? Because let's also understand, you got New Hampshire today. You got Nevada coming up, yep. significant Latino population. Yep. You got South Carolina, okay? He, the next debate, he's on the stage. Mm -hmm. mm. He's on the piece. Yep. So I'm sure he's probably like, damn, why did I have to qualify for the Why did they change the rules for the debate? <laughs> so now he now is going to get hit yep. by the other candidates. It's not going to be front and center, and he is going to have to have an explanation. Because mm -hmm. other folks are going to do exactly what I just did. Walk through and hit play, hit play, and there are tons of other comments out there. Mm -hmm. He's got to put the work in, uh, and if he's not willing to do it, then his campaign won't be able to garner the support that's necessary. And he needs to just tell the truth on some of this stuff. I mean, we've already unpacked a lot of it, but most of those stops didn't come up with any guns. Mm -hmm. If he really wanted to talk about real crime, there was all kinds of crime happening on Staten Island and Long Island and right there, you know, in the financial district with all them cats who was using cocaine and they yep. never got caught or never got clipped. So I just need him to actually have a real, give us some real talk about where he is today and why he made the choices that he made before. Absolutely. And can I just, can I just say, quick, this, yeah, say this very quickly? Black, whether, if he does, you know, do a, you know, go do the circuit with black media or whatever, black people have to not allow him any wiggle room to say, but Donald Trump is a racist. Mm -hmm. Hold him accountable for his own actions. Don't let him get in front of black media and say, well, you know, but Donald Trump is so bad too. Well, first of all, two no. things, two things would be true at the same I was time. About to say, but, 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 but don't let him do it. No, but don't let him do it. No, but the point I made earlier was that when he invoked, when he invoked. Trump in his statement, I'm going like, dude, that ain't gonna fly. I mean, like, right. bottom line is, yep. he, he see, see, if at the if, top if, of the if, state, if I had, so, the, so the issue that I had, the issue that I have is an anatomy of the statement. Mm -hmm. You begin your statement by invoking Trump deleting a tweet, not accepting responsibility. Now, so, so let me just so for the for the people for the people who are on his campaign, let let me just uh, say right now, that's bullshit. Okay. That's bullshit. For anybody on the comms team, on the Michael Bloomberg team, for any African Americans on his team, somebody should have said, yo, that's some bullshit. Okay? I'm just going to be straight up. Why am I saying that? Because the issue here is not Donald Trump deleting a tweet. Nope. The issue is what you said. And so it's a cute game in terms of uh, trying to move to that uh, whole point here. Like the opening line, go to my iPad. President Trump's deleted tweet is the latest example of his endless efforts to divide Americans. No, sorry, Michael Bloomberg, that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. that, that line should be completely deleted. Mm -hmm. Now, if you wanted to start, you should have started with, I inherited the police practice of stop and frisk. That's what you should have started with. And then when you go to the bottom, okay? So just so just so just so we're clear here in terms of how you unpack this. If you remove the first sentence and you go from I inherited to the black and latino communities Y'all, he literally spent more words in this statement trying to explain other stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to the second paragraph, now it's all about his commitment to criminal justice. <laughs> now you go to, then, then basically saying he gave the idea for my brother's keeper to, to Obama. Obama. Right. He literally says, <laughs> we created the Young Men's Initiative to help young men of color stay on track for success, which President Obama built on to create My Brother's Keeper. But then the last paragraph, in contrast, Trump, this, 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 I'll take, take you on. <laughs> no. You have to deal with what you said. Mm -hmm. 
Obama's on vacation, like, why? And so, trying to why? sit here and now, oh, you know, Trump this, Trump that, uh, I've done this. No, the <laughs> reality, and, 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 and this is the thing that, 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 that is important. We cannot live in an America where women who are talking about the Me Too movement talk about the trauma mm -hmm. that they have had to endure from men catcalling, mm -hmm. from men making sexually suggestive comments in the workplace, from men physically sexually assaulting women, whether in the workplace, at school, at home. We got a whole lot. We cannot talk about soldiers suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and what they're enduring on the battlefield around the world. The, both of those cannot be ignored and are fundamentally and critically important. But what we also must deal with is the trauma inflicted on black people and brown people for simply walking while black, mm -hmm. for simply walking while brown. We cannot ignore the trauma, the fear that exists among black and brown people who were the victims of a Xerox copy hmm. thrown up against walls, searched, accosted, found nothing. Now y'all can go. Mm -hmm. Because if you understand the trauma of black people since 1619, the trauma of being kidnapped in your homeland. The trauma of being in the slave, the hole of a slave ship. The trauma of being sold. The trauma of seeing your family beaten and separated. The trauma of seeing individuals having their feet, uh, feet cut off who tried to run away. The trauma of individuals having to pick cotton and beaten and whipped. The trauma of black kids having to grow up and seeing mama and daddy have to step into the street when it's muddy when somebody white comes by. The trauma of looking at somebody white and you can't look them in the eyes. The trauma of being accused of sleeping with a white woman. If you want to understand the trauma, you go down to the lynching memorial that's in Montgomery, Alabama. You understand the trauma of Jim Crow. The trauma of just being black and you get stopped. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the trauma that Michael Bloomberg has to understand. Mm -hmm. That what was unleashed upon black people in New York City and brown people, and let me add, New York City has the largest concentration of black people in the United States. So Michael Bloomberg, I don't care about your young men's initiative. <laughs> because Michael Bloomberg, there probably was a young black man who was going to school, who was doing the right thing, who got stopped. And that one encounter completely changed the course of his life. We don't know what that young man did in the classroom the next day. We don't know if he tuned out. We don't know if he then began to lash out at authority because of how he was treated by a cop. See, Michael Bloomberg, that's what you don't seem to recognize that was unleashed on African Americans. Do I believe the Michael Bloomberg campaign is over? No. But what I will say is this. This statement alone is simply insufficient. And African-Americans 
across this country, Latinos across this country, black parents, black mothers, black fathers, grandparents, aunts and uncles deserve a conversation so we can understand Mike Bloomberg if you have actually changed. <coughs> Why am I saying that? Because right now in the White House, Mike Bloomberg is a man who took out full page ads saying that the Central Park Five young men should get the death penalty. And Mike Bloomberg, you fought those same five young men from getting a settlement in their case. In fact, Mike Bloomberg, you are going to have to reckon with the fact that you would not settle. And the only reason the case of the exonerated five was settled for $40 million was because you left the mayor's office. And it was Bill de Blasio, the newly elected mayor of the city of New York, who in 2014 approved the settlement in that case. So Michael Bloomberg, we want to see you stand up and say and call for the release of all of the depositions taken in the Central Park Five case. We want to see what was stated in those depositions when it came to that case. Because you, you Michael Bloomberg, cannot in a statement criticize Donald Trump when on this very issue, you and Donald Trump were boozing buddies. You defended stop and frisk. Donald Trump wanted stop and frisk. Donald Trump doubled down on the Central Park Five. You fought their settlement. And you could say all these other different things about how I've done this and done that. That is no different than a man who beats his wife and then brings her flowers and buys her gifts. You are going to have to speak to this issue. Because right now there's a liar sitting in the Oval Office. And we've got to know for real whether or not you have truly learned from your mistakes or if you're simply making the political calculus and you hope that our disdain for Trump is strong enough to overlook what you said and did. All right, folks, back to that whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. All right, folks, are you looking to enhance your leadership skills? Are you trying to enhance those of your team as well? Well, if so, you should join Dr. Reverend Dr. Jackie Hood Martin for uh, her newest online course and mastermind group, How Successful People Think. She will be your guide as you learn timeless leadership principles to apply to daily living. The offer expires February 28th. To register to, or start the course online, go to www.livetolead.com forward slash Leesburg. That's www.live, L-I-V-E, the number two, lead, L-E-A-D dot com forward slash Leesburg. Now back to your Roland Martin Unfiltered video. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it.